As Chinese President Xi Jinping once said, the history of the development of Marxism is the history of all of its development at the hands of Marx as well as Engels, along with their successors too, in accordance with developments in time and practice and knowledge. Its great history is one of continued self-refinement through the absorption of the cultural and intellectual achievements of our entire human history to date. Therefore, Marxism is able to maintain its current relevance and youthful approach to life and continue to explore new problems in contemporary developments around the world today and also respond to new challenges facing humanity as its mission has always been. I can still remember when I visited Marx in Paris. It was the summer of 1844. The two of us quickly seemed to find ourselves in complete agreement across all the fields of theory. And we, having been working closely together ever since that summer, what I have done all my life is what I was always destined to do, which is to play second fiddle to Marx. And I think I've done quite a good job. I'm glad that I have a first fiddle player, especially one of his greatest marks. I can only solemnly promise to serve the proletariat actively for the rest of my life. I hope that in the future, I will live up to this honor that I've been given. Environment district in Wuppertal, in the Ruhr region, which is Germany's famous industrial center, a thoroughfare runs through the city that is widely known as Friedrich Engels Alley. Engels was born here, once upon a time over 200 years ago, on November 28, 1820. A memorial tablet on the street reads as follows. This is the birthplace of Frederick Engels, who is one of the most famous sons of the entire city, who is also one of the founders of scientific socialism. Right next to the stone tablet is the original Engels house. This here is the very place where the Engels family was born and raised once upon a time. Today it has become a densely populated area. It was established around November 28, 1820, and the place has only continued to develop since then. Most of the building uh, was unfortunately destroyed by the bombing that took place during the devastation of World War II, and after that people started to rebuild the Engels house again. The Barman district in the city of Wuppertal used to be the city of Barman in the Kingdom of Prussia, located in the Wipper Valley of the Rhineland. It is nestled among rolling hills and lush forests. More than 100 kilometers away from here, the town of Trier, which is also part of the Rhineland, it is the birthplace of Karl Marx, who is another very well-known founder of scientific socialism. Marx, who is two years older than Engels, was born on the 5th of May, 1818, into a well-known family of lawyers. The bell that can be heard ringing in the Barman church dates back to the Middle Ages. But in the early 19th century, the Vipa Valley was filled with a roar of spinning machines.
Sparman was the center of the German textile industry, and Engel's great-grandfather was the founder of a textile factory there. Over several generations, it grew into one of the largest enterprises in the entire region up to the time of Engels' father. Engels' father, Frederick Engels Sr., was what you call politically conservative and he raised his children with a strict religious upbringing. Engels' mother, a kind-hearted and cheerful woman, loved literature and art. Engels inherited the kindness, the optimism of his mother, whom he loved deeply all his life. Engels enrolled in the Barman Municipal School at the age of eight. Five years later, he enrolled at the Elbefield High School, which is considered one of the best schools in all of Prussia. Engels excelled in all his various subjects at school, and his school report praised him for excellent conduct and high qualification. Although Engels was born into a family of factory owners, he had always been very sympathetic towards the oppressed and exploited masses, and often gave all of the money that he had saved to the less fortunate. This behavior made his father quite angry, straining their once good relationship. Engels had planned to enroll in university immediately after graduating from high school, but his father hoped that Engels, as the eldest son of the family, would give up his studies and that he would one day take over the family business from him. Nine months before he was due to graduate from school, Engels, who was yet to turn 17, was forced by his father to drop out of school. This sudden blow almost made Engels sink into a deep depression at first, but Engels decided that rather than sulking, he would accept the challenge and consider it fate. For a little while, Engels worked as one of the many clerks at his father's company in Burman. Months later, he was sent by his father to do an internship at a firm that was located in Bremen. Bremen, a port city found in northern Germany, was a thriving hub of trade and information. Engels not only learned about business there, but also read many progressive books and periodicals, eagerly absorbing all kinds of new ideas as well as new knowledge. He also started learning foreign languages. In a letter that he wrote to one of his closest middle school friends named Grabe, in addition to German, he also used other languages like English, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch, to name a few. Engels also actively took part in progressive literature groups at the time. He wrote many poems and plays and tried his hand at composing and painting. While in Bremen, Engels was only 18 years old when he anonymously published his first political essay, Letters from Wuppertal. It exposed the brutal oppression of the workers by capitalists in his hometown. The article caused quite a big stir in the Wuppe Valley and angered the local capitalists.
This is a caricature drawn by Engels after it happened. He describes the angrier reaction of all the property owners after reading the strong article that he had written. At the end of September 1841, 20-year-old Engels then went to Berlin to enlist in the army and begin a one-year service. The barracks of Engels' unit there was near Berlin University. German classical philosophers like Fichte, Hegel, and Schelling once taught at this very university. Marx himself would also graduate from this university. Engels often sat in classes at Berlin University. At that time, the idealist philosopher Schelling was teaching his political theory and enlightenment philosophy there. Engels opposed the religious mysticism in Schelling's thought, and he wrote a paper and two pamphlets that he titled Schelling on Hegel exposing Schilling's real aim, which he believed was simply to maintain the feudal autocracy. Engels' criticism of Schilling attracted the attention of the philosophy community and the progressive press. It was especially praised and supported by the young Hegelian school. A group led by Powell brothers, who were all representatives of the young Hegelians, formed a group called the Berlin Free Men, and Engels took part in their various activities. But Engels' negative view of the group's idealism and the way that it despised the masses eventually led him to make the decision that would be the best for him to part ways with the young Hegelian school. After his years of military service, Engels went to Manchester on a business trip that was arranged by his father. Passing through Cologne, he met Marx for the first time ever. At that time, Marx was the editor of the Rhenish newspaper. He was opposed to the philosophical views held by the Powell brothers, because Marx was under the impression that Engels was an ally of the Powell brothers. He was initially lukewarm towards Engels. But Marx still appreciated the articles that Engels had written and asked him to write for the Rhenish newspaper. Engels, of course, happily accepted the offer. Engels' hometown, Warmen, with its cotton textile industry, was known as the Manchester of Germany. Manchester in England was the center of the world cotton textile industry. It was the birthplace of what is known as the Industrial Revolution. In the mid-19th century, Britain became known as the world's factory since it accounted for half of the world's total industrial output. The revolution led to an increase in society's productive forces, and it brought about a lot of profound social changes. Society was very clearly divided into two opposing classes, namely the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In Manchester, where we can say the capitalist industry was literally booming, the cotton tycoons consequently possessed huge wealth, while the workers, sadly, lived a very miserable life. This is a painting of a child laborer. He's crawling along a narrow tunnel while dragging an extremely heavy coal wagon behind him with a thick chain tight around his waist. This was the harsh reality. Many children all under the age of 10 were working for up to 14 or even 16 hours a day, every single day. Many of them worked so hard that they died before they could really live. Engels 
Engels went to work at the office of Ehrman and Engels, a firm in which his father was also a shareholder. But he wasn't interested in business at all. During his 21 months spent in Manchester, Engels traveled to all the corners of the city, and he extensively investigated the lives and struggles of its workers. He gave up all bourgeois social activities, as well as things like banquets, port, and yes, he even gave up champagne. Instead, he spent most of his free time with the ordinary workers who were slaving away in the city day after day. He felt happy, and also proud to do so. Engels personally knew quite a few enlightened proletarians. Among them was Mary Baines, who was a weaver. Mary was a brave and upright woman who was a class-conscious Irish worker. She often accompanied Engels in his visits to factories and even to the slums. Their common cause is what brought these two people together. The German proletarian poet Wirf, a friend of Engels and Mary, once wrote a poem in which he was singing Mary's praises. Mary, the young lady, with warm, impetuous blood in her veins, all the way from Ireland, with the tide she came, she came from Tipperary, her deep dark eyes always twinkling with passion and bravery. In Manchester, Engels came into contact with the workers' movement for the first time. Engels often participated in the gatherings of the Chartist movement, wrote articles for the Chartist newspapers, which was called Northern Star. And he met the leader of the left-wing Chartist school, Harney. Engels also got an occult chapeau very well during that specific time. Exiled in Britain, he was the leader of the League of the Just. Engels studied the works of the British classical political economists and the works of British and French utopian socialists, combining them with a the practical experience of the workers' movement to arrive at new conclusions. At that time, Marx, along with his wife Jenny von Westphalen, made their way to Paris to settle down there. Marx and Arnold Rouge co-founded the German-French yearbook. In February 1844, Engels, at the mere age of 23 years old, went on to publish the critical outline of national economics and the state of England, past and present, by Thomas Carlyle in the German-French yearbook. For the first time, the critical outline of national economics examined the capitalist economic system from the socialist standpoint and made preliminary critique of the bourgeois political economy. The article pointed out that socioeconomic relations play a decisive role in social life. Private ownership is at the root of contradictions in capitalist society, and the power to eliminate private ownership lies with the proletariat. The article would become the first milestone in the development of what is known as Marxist political economy. In the same issue of the German-French Yearbook, 25-year-old Marx published two articles. One is the Jewish issue, and one is the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. And he arrived at the exact same conclusion as Engels. The proletariat is the material force to transform the world, and its historical mission is to truly liberate all human beings. In the same period, these two young men both made the transition from idealism to materialism slowly but surely, and from revolutionary democratism to communism.
based on his field work and the wealth of information you had collected during the time of Manchester, Engels wrote a book, The Condition of the Working Class in England. The book was published in May 1845. Lennon would later say that no book before or after 1845 has so vividly and so accurately described the poverty of the working class. Engels hit the nail right on the head. The condition of the working class in England contains a very important point of view. The industrial revolution caused the complete transformation of bourgeois society and the changes in the means of production in the mode of production caused changes in the class structure of society. This way, Engels was close to discovering the dialectical relationship between productive forces and relations of production. A discovery that is at the very heart of historical materialism. More than a decade later, in January 1859, Marx wrote in a, a contribution to the critique of political economy that, in the condition of the working class in England, Engels came to the same result as he did in arriving from a different road. Marx fully affirmed Engels's independent work on the creation of historical materialism, which is an an indelible historical achievement of Engels. In Manchester, Engels thoroughly studied various socialist theories by doing field work on the conditions of the workers and taking part in the workers' struggles. He reached the conclusion that the proletariat was a class who was suffering a lot and that its economic status forced it to consequently strive for its own liberation and to undertake the historical mission of overthrowing the capitalist system. Engels unwavering devoted the rest of his life from there on after mainly to the liberation of the proletariat. At the end of August 1844, Engels decided it was time for him to leave Manchester and he made an appointment with Marx to meet in Paris on his way back home. This place is called Café de la Régence and it is close to the Louvre, which Marx and Engels frequently spent time at when they reunited in Paris back in August 1844. Engels stayed in Paris for 10 days and stayed at Marx's flat at number 38 Rue Vanu. They had heartfelt conversations, day and night, that just showed again they were in complete agreement in all theoretical fields. From then on, the two revolutionary mentors began their 40-year-long journey of not only common cause, but also great friendship. In Paris, Marx and Friedrich Engels began to write their very first co-authored book, The Holy Family. In this book, they set out some key ideas of historical materialism, proposed that material production plays a decisive role in social development. They stressed that the people are actually the real creators of history and that the proletariat not only could, but also have to liberate itself.
After returning to Barman, Engels wrote his letter to Marx. Ever since, the two of us have parted ways. I've not felt as happy and as human as I was feeling during the time, 10 days we spent together, working together in your house. Marx's revolutionary activities in Paris aroused the hatred of the Prussian government, which demanded that the French government expel Marx. This was the first time that Marx was expelled by the reactionary authorities. In February 1845, Marx arrived in Brussels, the capital city of Belgium. Because he had spent most of the limited money he had available in the publication of the German-French yearbook, Marx's family was left without money that they needed to settle down. When Engels found out about this, he immediately began to raise money for Marx. He sent him a hundred towers, which was the payment for his own contribution to the condition of the working class in England. In his letter to Marx, he wrote the following. I would honestly be more than happy to give you the remuneration for the first book that I wrote about England. At least then, you won't make those dogs happy that they have now gotten you into such deep financial trouble. Regards, Engels. Look, right here we have a very old notebook. This notebook was found by Engels when he was busy gathering all of Marx's manuscripts. Several pages of the notebook are the 11 outlines of Feuerbach, written by Marx when he first arrived in Brussels. Engels called these 11 outlines the first document containing the budding genius of a brand new outlook on the world as we know it. In the outline, Marx put forward the scientific concept of practice for the first time. He expounded that practice is the best standard to test truth, and he pointed out that human nature is the sum of all social relations. This laid the foundation for the establishment of historical materialism. It was also here that Marx first put forward his now well-known saying that goes, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various different ways. Point I have is to change it. The passage is engraved on the wall of the main hall of Humboldt University in Berlin that Marx had formerly attended. In April 1845, like Marx, Engels moved to Brussels, and he lived at number seven, Rue d'Orléans, while Marx's family lived in number five. In order to clear up the former philosophical beliefs and to expound the basic principles of historical materialism, together Marx and Frederick Engels began to plan and then to write the German ideology in autumn of that exact same year. Engels went to Marx's house almost every day while they were planning and writing, and the two men often worked late into the night. The German ideology was unfortunately not published while Marx and Engels were still alive, but this work has been preserved in a relatively complete form to this day. This is a page from the manuscript of the German ideology which reads as follows, and we quote, In reality and for the practical materialists, more specifically the communists, it is a question of revolutionizing the existing world as we know it today, of practically attacking and changing existing things. The German ideology is the foundational work of historical materialism, and this book systematically expounded on. Principles like social existence determine social consciousness. Material production plays a decisive role in the development of human society. The contradiction between productive forces and production relation promotes both social as well as historical development, demonstrating the historical 
inevitability of communism replacing capitalism. Engels always attributed the discovery of historical materialism to Marx himself. In fact, just like Marx, Engels was also the founder of this great theory. On the exterior wall of the House of the Swan, a tavern in the Grand Place, the main city square in Brussels, there is a plot that reads, the great German philosophy Marx lived in Brussels from February 1845 to March 1848, together with the German Workers' Association and the Democratic Association. He celebrated the New Year's Eve in 1847 and 1848, right here in this house. In those days, the first floor of the tavern was a cafe, where Marx, along with his comrades in arms, gathered almost every day. In order to prepare ideologically and organizationally for the establishment of the proletarian party, Karl Marx and Engels established the Communist Correspondence Committee of Brussels to strengthen their ties with other countries. The core members of the committee were Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and Philip Charles Gigo, a Belgian communist. The committee would also be attended by Heinrich Burgers, Moses Hess, Joseph Wedemeyer, Willem Wettling, Willem Wolf, and Ludwig von Westphalen. The Communist Correspondence Committee had branches in German cities such as Berlin, Hamburg, France, the Netherlands, Britain, Denmark, and other countries in order to exchange information, study struggle strategies, and to guide the development of workers and democratic movements everywhere. The Workers' Organization, which was most closely associated with the Communist Correspondence Commission in Brussels, was the League of the Just. The League of the Just, originally an organization made up of German craftsmen living in France, was founded in Paris in 1836. It was forced to move to London because of the failure of the uprising that was launched by the Society of the Seasons. In contact with both Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the leaders of the League of the Just gradually started to accept their theories and they invited them not only to join the League but also to help them to restructure it. This provided an opportunity for Marx and Engels to widely spread their ideas and also gave them the opportunity to create a proletarian party. In June 1847, the League of the Just held its Congress in the City of London. According to the proposal made by Marx and Engels, the Congress changed its name from the League of the Just to the Communist League, which is the first ever international proletarian party of the world. At the end of November 1847, the Second Congress of the Communist League held in London was attended by both Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. The Congress gave them the responsibility of preparing for the publication a complete theoretical and practical party program. This program would later become known as the Communist Manifesto. Roughly around 90% of the manuscripts and archives are of Marx and Engels, including a page from the Communist Manifesto manuscript, are in the collection of the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. Before Karl Marx and Frederick Engels even started to write anything for the Communist Manifesto, Engels had drafted two separate documents to prepare for the manifesto. At that very first Congress that was held by the Communist League, Engels drafted the first version of what would later be known as the draft of the Communist Creed for the League, and submitted it to the local branches for discussion. 
Engels was entrusted by the Paris branch of the above-mentioned League to draw up a new draft program called Principles of Communism that's created on the basis of the draft of the Communist Creed to be discussed at the Second Congress of the Communist League. These two documents presented and explained the basic principles of scientific socialism and at the same time laid a foundation for the writing of the Communist Manifesto on a series of both major and theoretical and practical issues. The two documents used a question and answer format to address issues of doctrine. Believing that this format was not exactly suitable for party program, Engels wrote to Marx and he suggested that it should perhaps be amended and that it should instead be called the Communist Manifesto. In December 1847, Marx and Engels both returned to Brussels to further study the content structure and expression of the Communist Manifesto and worked out its outline. At the end of December, Engels went to Paris while Marx continued to write the Communist Manifesto. In January 1848, the Communist Manifesto was completed. At that time, Marx was 29 and Engels was 27. In late February 1848, this pure masterpiece with its strong historical foundation, its eloquent truths and with its lofty revolutionary sentiments was published in London City. The publication of the Communist Manifesto truly marked the birth of Marxism and ushered in a new era of the international communist movement. The Manifesto provided scientific theoretical guidance for the liberation of the proletariat and oppressed nations. The Manifesto clarified the objective law that human society is bound to move towards communism, which lays a theoretical foundation for the communists to form their ideals and beliefs. Large numbers were later published and even translated, and Marx and Engels wrote seven prefaces for all its various versions. In the preface of the German version of 1872, Marx and Engels stressed that although the situation has changed, over the past 25 years, the general principles set forth in the manifesto are completely correct. They said that the practical application of these principles should be changed as per the historical conditions at that time and place. Doing so requires us to study Marx's theory and to combine it with practice. This is the only page that is left of the Communist Manifesto manuscript. In 2013, UNESCO included this very precious manuscript page in the international memory of the World Register along with Marx's annotated edition of Capital Volume 1. UNESCO says that these two works are some of the most important publications of the 19th century and have had far-reaching influence after being translated into almost all the languages in the world and spreading around the entire globe. The Communist Manifesto was the first monograph written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels to be translated and later published in full in China. In 1936, when talking with Edgar Snow in Yan'an, comrade Mao Zedong recalled he had read the Chinese text of the Communist Manifesto during his second visit to Beijing after the May 4th movement, and since reading it, he had built up his faith in Marxism. The first complete Chinese translation of the Communist Manifesto was published in Shanghai in August 1920. The translator was Cheng Wangdao, a member of the very early Communist Party of Shanghai. When translating the Communist Manifesto, Cheng Wangdao was so deeply into the work that he accidentally dipped one of the rice dumplings his mother had sent him into his ink pot. He did not notice his mistake. And as he ate, he said, it is so sweet. 
It is well known that the taste of faith is and can indeed be very sweet if you believe. On 29th November 2012, when Chinese President Xi Jinping visited the Road of Revival exhibition, he told this touching story to all the other members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo of the CPC Central Committee. The translation and publication of the manifesto was an important task in the founding period of the Communist Party of China and directly complemented the party's founding activities. In the revolutionary era, the Chinese communists who were mainly represented by comrade Mao Zedong combined the basic principles of Marxism and Leninism with the concrete practice of Chinese revolution and created Mao Zedong thought. They made this historical leap of combining Marxism with Chinese modern day realities, something quite remarkable. They also won the victory of the new democratic revolution and they realized national independence and the liberation that Chinese people had dreamed of having for many generations. Lenin once said that, the period when Karl Marx and Frederick Engels participated in the mass revolutionary struggle from 1848 to 1849 was the most remarkable step out of all the steps they took in their lifetime. The publication of the Communist Manifesto in 1848 came when revolutions were breaking out across Europe. In January of that year, an uprising broke out in Palermo, Italy against the king, followed by the February Revolution in France, the March Revolution in Germany, and many revolutions in other European countries as well. In April, Marx and Engels returned to Germany to participate in the revolution there. After returning to Germany, Marx and Engels immediately organized a new Rhenish newspaper to be on the ideological front line to guide the revolutionary struggles. They tried raising funds from various sources, but did not seem to have much luck. Engels asked his father for money, but his father turned him away saying he would rather see him take a thousand bullets than giving them even a thousand dollars. Engels was back at square one. But in the end, Marx took a few thousand dollars from his father's estate, and Engels squeezed a few hundred dollars from his living expenses to start the newspaper. On the 1st of June, 1848, the first issue of the new Rheinische Zeitung was published, with Marx as the chief editor, and Engels acting as his chief assistant. Being very knowledgeable and quick thinking, Engels started to write many editorials. In only one year, Engels wrote more than a hundred articles and newsletters. It is a time of revolution, and it's a real pleasure for me to be engaged in running a daily newspaper at such a time, he said. You see with your own eyes the effect of each word. You see how every new article hits the target like lightning striking, and you can see how people react to it firsthand. That's great. New Rhenish newspaper had been attracting attention thanks to its distinctive characteristics and the role it plays as the voice of the revolution. The paper became a base for the revolutionary activities of the Communist League in Germany, led by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. In 1848, workers in Paris launched the June Uprising, which was the first major confrontation between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The uprising was ultimately defeated by the repression of the reactionary authorities, Thereafter, the revolutionary situation in Europe had been reversed. In late September, the Prussian reactionary authorities imposed martial law in Cologne, disarmed the citizens, banned the publication of new Rhenish newspaper, and ordered the arrest of several editors, including Frederick Ingalls. 
Engels was left no choice but to go on the run. From Barman to Brussels and then to Paris, he would eventually walk to Switzerland. Not having a single penny to his name, Engels had to stop and write to his family and Marx to ask for help. Marx, who was strapped for cash himself, didn't even hesitate for a second to send Engels the only 11 thalers he had along with 50 thaler overdraft. In his letter to Engels, Marx said, it is pure fantasy for me to leave you all alone, just for a minute, Frederick. You will always be my best friend, don't you ever forget that. I really hope that you'll be able to say that with certainty that I am also your best friend. Yours sincerely, Marx. At the beginning of 1849, Engels returned to Cologne to continue editing New Rhenish newspaper. But on May 19th, the paper was forced to close. This time, Marx was expelled to Paris, France, because he had no Prussian nationality. And soon after, he was exiled to London. Engels decided to join insurgents in baden Falls, and there he threw himself straight into the fiery battlefield. And by doing so, he proved that the most determined communist is also one of the bravest soldiers ever known. The baden Falls insurgents eventually failed in their fight against the Prussian army, and Engels then withdrew with them to Switzerland. A few months later, he detoured to London to visit his good friend Marx. In London, they supported the political exiles, reorganized the Communist League, and founded the new Rhenish newspaper, Political and Economic Review, summing up the experience of the European revolutions that had just passed. In order to summarize the experience of the 1848 revolution and in order to better guide proletarian revolutionary struggles now and in the future, Marx and Engels wrote many theoretical pieces, including the address of the central authority to the Communist League, as well as the class struggles in France and the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte and the peasant war in Germany. The core goal of these important works is to expound the Marxist concept of state and state theory. And the central idea being put forward is the theory of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that the proletariat must smash the state. Machinery of the bourgeois dictatorship in the revolution implement proletariat dictatorship and realize the continuous revolution of the worker-peasant alliance. The exiled revolutionaries in London faced a big dilemma. Marx's family was consequently finding themselves in terrible poverty. Meanwhile, Engels' life was also very difficult at this time. In order to help Marx financially so that he could mainly concentrate on political and economic research, Engels made a very difficult decision to go back to work for his father's company in Manchester. The passionate revolutionary years suddenly seemed to have come and gone, but you can bet that the stormy days had only begun. Due to the changes in the situation, the struggles they faced differed. But Marx and Engels' persistent pursuit of the truth and their infinite loyalty to the cause of human liberation never wavered. They would only keep taking firmer and more mature steps to lead the proletarian movement to its next climax, true heroes.